<laughs> Great. Thank you, Greg, for all the information. <laughs> so good evening, everyone. Uh, my name is Raul Amez, and I'm a senior BI consultant with DesignMind. I'm actually down in the San Diego area. Well, where the skies have finally cleared and the sun is shining after a few days of some record rain. It's been pretty interesting. But uh, speaking of rain, um, I'm happy to be presenting here with the Portland Power BI Group. Um, it's been a few years since I've been up to the Portland area. I, I really enjoyed the last time I was there. Um, actually worked with some of the distilleries in the area. I mean, there's there's quite a bit now uh, I mean, for the past few years, so it's pretty interesting. Um, as you can see, I've had 12 years of client experience in the wine and spirits industry and in financial services, uh, aerospace manufacturing, and the fashion industry. I've led BI seminars uh, covering the full stack of BI development from ETL work to data visualizations and doing consulting on data governance. So today, uh, I'm going to present on self-service Power BI, and what we'll do is we'll go over some tips, some best practices, um, some scenarios that Microsoft has kind of laid out, um, different modes of self-service, and we're going to demo a couple of scenarios and um, some of the features that Power BI has that empowers data reuse, customization, and doing off-the-cuff or ad hoc analysis. So what is uh, self-service, right? That's a, it's a, it's, it's a hot buzzword, uh, but a lot of people define it in different ways. Uh, Gartner defines it as end users designing and deploying their own reports and analysis within an approved and supported architecture and tools portfolio. So I, I really like this definition because it addresses a common misconception about self-service. A lot of times when people think self-service, they think um, it just means users can do whatever they want and anything goes. Um, but that's not that's not the case. To have uh, a successful self-service environment, well, you need an environment and you need uh, policies in place that make self-service productive and reliable. So, Microsoft actually identifies several scenarios uh, for self-service and strategies to help design these environments. So I'll go over these different scenarios and identify the one that we'll focus on today. And I'll also talk about how we can use uh, data management and report creation tools within Power BI Desktop and the Power BI service to carry out uh, these self-service techniques. So based on the Power BI, um, the Microsoft Power BI adoption roadmap, uh, we have three primary strategies. Uh, I should go back here. Three primary strategies uh, for self-service. We have business-led self-service, enterprise self-service, and managed self-service. Uh, the two extremes would be the business-led self-service model and the enterprise self-service model where business-led is completely decentralized where all content is owned and managed by business users and that's mostly considered like a, a bottom-up strategy uh, or like an agile and, and an agile environment um if this is the case you'll want of a few guidelines. If this is if, if you have a scenario where you want this kind of business-led self-service BI environment, uh, you'll need uh, well, this is usually in a place where data exploration is a high priority. Where and when you have skilled people within the departments who have the ability to carry out uh, BI analysis and flexibility and rapid reaction are a high priority, and th those would be an agile environment. And you want uh, guidelines um, in place and policies in place to keep things under control. Otherwise, you'll end up with um, like a BI swamp. Uh, you want to provide training and technical guidance. You'll want some shared data sets. You also want to ensure that there's as much documentation as possible in order to avoid tribal knowledge and siloing. 
because that, that can happen when you have different departments doing essentially the same thing um, and you have the siloing of business knowledge and data doesn't get knowledge shared. Um, knowledge doesn't get shared across the departments and um, the teams. So you want to avoid that with kind of proper documentation and policies in place for, to, to handle that. You'll want to take advantage of the promoted endorsements feature in Power BI to make your trusted data sets identifiable and discoverable, and we'll demo that a little bit later. I actually worked with a startup retailer in this scenario a few years ago, and I helped them shift into a managed BI environment um, as they were constantly recreating data sets and measures with inconsistent business rules. So they churned out a lot of content, but it made um, maintenance a challenge because there's a lot of reuse of business rules and applied in similar but different ways. So there was those kind of inconsistencies that you want to avoid. So enterprise BI works best when you have an environment that is that has highly sensitive data or is subject to regulations. Um, you'll have a centralized team that manages all BI items end to end. You'll also have well-defined content with robust requirements gathering processes. And there's little need to customize or explore data beyond the reporting that's delivered. So everything is canned reporting. Everything has been gone through uh, UAT, been certified, and the users can use what they get, and that's pretty much it. Um, this is more of a waterfall kind of situation. Uh, direct access to data is also limited and highly regulated. Uh, so I worked with a financial services uh, clients where this was the case. So we uh, we had a core BI team. We maintained all the data, gave users access to specific pieces of requested data, specific tables only. And uh, we had role level security set up tightly um, and report creation requests had to be highly documented. Tickets had to be opened and followed a, a form and everything had to be designed and uh, approved before going into development. So uh, yeah, so those are the, the two extremes. You could have completely uh, business-led self-service, or you have enterprise BI, which isn't really self-service at all, is, is that's highly centralized BI environment. And this balanced uh, middle ground is managed self-service, which uh, works when you have centralized data and when that aligns with the company culture, and you have a team of BI engineers who can manage that data. And you have, uh, and there's a high value placed on the reuse of data across the organization, and report creators need to produce their own content. So, um, so you'd have like a core central team who manages master data sets, um, probably does the the data warehouse architecture, and maybe creates some core reports, can reports, the core apps, uh, but then they allow users to say download. Uh, their own PBIX files and uh, make modifications to the reports, upload their own versions of reports to their own workspaces, um, create composite models and things like that. Um, so it kind of creates that, um, that it's a, it's a best of both worlds scenario because you, you have trusted data, but you also have the flexibility to do that kind of self-service. So uh, I like to think of uh, self-service in terms of you have data self-service and reporting self-service. Um, you want to set up your data, uh, especially in Power BI and in, in your data sets and the in the uh, and in the Power BI service in a way that it's it's friendly and it's it empowers users and encourages users to use uh, reuse trusted uh, data. So um, We'll have an, an example here where we have a master data set. Um, it's going to be a shared data set that you can use across different reports, centralized. It promotes uh, trust in a single source of truth. Uh, we'll also see how we can use data flows. Um, we can reuse data tables that can be refreshed separately from the data set. 
and they could also be used across the power platform. Uh, there's also composite modeling, which allow flexibility at the edge, right? And it supplements verified data with additional reference data. And we can use data marts, which is the latest addition to Power BI. It allows, uh, allows the creation of fully managed uh, database created by business users. And it, again, it empowers self-service modeling and policy management. Raul, I would love to ask a question on this part. You know, we've yeah. seen data flows mature, composite models, yes. shared data sets, awesome. Have you actually implemented or seen data marts in the wild actually work? Because I know when it first came out, we started playing it through like, this is kind of clunky. Um, but I, I think <laughs> the promise of data marts is what we all want, right? Have mm -hmm. you seen an implementation of it actually, you know, green light or is it still kind of funky it's still it's still in preview it's still being developed and, and I, I kind of throw that out there in the demo that i do um yeah yeah, yeah i do have a, i actually do have a partner at uh design mind who has implemented uh data marts uh, at a client uh, as a as kind of a kind of a side project mm -hmm. um it's been interesting <laughs> <laughs> uh when because when I first did this presentation, I did a, this similar presentation uh, several months ago, and um, and this was when Data Marts was brand new, and uh, she got excited and she started to to experiment with it, and it it was working, but then it was just you know, the incremental refresh wasn't working properly, and for some reason the the, the Data Mart would go unavailable for some time, mm. so it really was not ready for prime time. Mm. So I'm going to throw that out there uh, to you all is that you know. I think the the idea is that this is the the future, right? This is where Microsoft is investing their development and their resources is to uh, bring in more of the Power BI desktop functionality in onto the web. And uh, you know, it, it's like and some people are kind of hesitant to get on board with that, and it's definitely uh, um, in beta. Uh, if, if it's even, yeah, I would say beta preview, mm -hmm. but. Um, Oh, and based on what my my colleague has been doing in more recent weeks, it's been more reliable and things have been functioning a little better. So there's definitely Great. been updates. Um, there is a back in January, there was a a feature update posted to the Power BI blog detailing some of the latest developments and changes. And I think they may have a roadmap as well for future development on data In marts. the wave one. Yeah, they came out with a pretty robust wave one roadmap. Mm -hmm. um, and it's to your point, it seems like so much more is coming into the service, right? Mm -hmm. With desktop features. I mean, we all see what's going to happen with desktop. It's going to have hopefully parity online you know we're hopefully going to get finally source control i think they pulled that github thing from the the roadmap um oh, wow. hopefully they bring it back on um but anyway thanks for the two cents on data marts good to hear it is maturing and yeah to your point this is the future yeah because i noticed like say data flows has been has been deemed like legacy now and so really? I, I think they're yeah i noticed that recently so um oh. so it, it, yeah, I, I think because because that's one of the common um, pieces of feedback I heard from from people using data marts is like, hey, isn't this just a big data flow? And yeah, it, it kind of is. Um, you know, but data flows are great because you have very specific table that you can just focus on and just increment and refresh that table specifically separate from everything else. It, it, um, but yeah, it, it's uh, it's interesting to see how that um, develops in time. Very much so. Okay. Anyway, stop. Sorry for ruining your flow. No, no, that was Keep great. No, I no, I appreciate that the that commentary. That was good. Um, and so so we have data kind of self service techniques and tools that we can use. Um, but there's also report uh, self service tools and techniques. So I like to use dynamic filters, which allow the switching of measures and customization on a report. Uh, field parameters, this is also in preview. Um, you can reuse visualizations across uh, multiple fields. Um, you could use bookmarks. That's a very common uh, tool within Power BI to, to create variations on a report and give flexibility to the content consumers. Um, and also show how you can 
organizer model in very kind of simple ways, but very just the way it cleans up uh, your data panel uh, can can pay dividends in, in terms of of making people comfortable and confident in, in the data that they're they're seeing in Power BI. So with that, uh, let's actually take a look at a uh, Power BI report. So I got one up here. Okay, so let's say I'm a BI developer working with a, a business user and they requested a, a standard sales report, uh, but they weren't exactly sure what kind of fields and measures they wanted to see on the report. So let's say I came up with a first pass at a standard sales dashboard. And we can use this as a starting point for further development. Um, this is using just the handy dandy good old adventure works data. <laughs> so uh, so here I got a pretty straightforward report. Um, you see your measures uh, are sales and you got basics, sales by category, bar chart, line charts and such. Um, so let's start with some organization little techniques first. Uh, that way we can create an environment that invites exploration. So one of the things here is the data panel. You'll see that we have these folders within each table. Like this is the customer table. And then I have my fields and I have customer fields and location fields. Uh, so I have my date table with fields there and I have dates, fiscal date. So everything is nice and tidy because I've seen data panels on reports where um, and this is this is a pretty uh, pretty small data set here, but we I've worked with data sets that have many, many, many dozens of fields and and uh, uh, key fields and sorting fields, and they're just just long, big piles of uh, of labels on the data panel, and that can get uh, really messy and hard to navigate. Um, you know, you're often relying on the search uh, bar here, which is great, right? Um, but I think it, it, it's really nice to have the ability to to organize your your fields within each table. Oh, real so, quick, uh, Rule, we got a question from Ginger. Yes. How do you make those folders? That's exactly where I'm getting at. Okay. <laughs> Perfect. <laughs> yeah. So, so you know. Uh, Windows kind of trains you to right click and create a new folder, uh, but unfortunately that does not work here. Um, so what I did is I switched to the data view and what you'll want to do is you'll actually want to go down to a field. Oh, actually is it, uh, I could be, all right, it might be here. Actually, I apologize, it's in the model view. So let's go to the model view and then go down to a field and then you can see here, display folder and here you can actually tell it what uh, folder you want you have to give it a path so here it's in field in the fields folder under customer uh let me see another one here um oh yeah so this one is a key so there's a here you have so this one doesn't have a subfolder, it's just in the keys display folder, right? So if I can if I wanted to create uh, another subfolder, I can create, I can do that. Click off, and there you see it creates a subfolder there and it tucks it in there. So that's how you would create the um, the folders and the subfolders. So again, you want to go into the model view select the field and then use the display folder uh, option there. You know, it's more of an art than a science. Um, at a bare minimum, I think it's uh, at least have your measures and your fields in separate folders. Um, so let's say, let's look at the sales table here. Um, I like to have a separate folder for measures. That way, anything that's calculated People, you know, you, you train your users to to go look into the measures folder so they can quickly just get to um, your actually your calculated col uh, fields in there, so they don't have to go digging around uh, into the other kind of fields, uh, especially if you have um, implicit versus explicit measures, which is actually the next thing I want to talk about. So let's go back in here. 
Um, so you have this idea in in BI in Power BI called you know, implicit versus explicit measures. So if we look at the sales table, expand this here. We have this visualization runs on the sales amount field. You see that here. So it's it's run on sales amount. And what I did was I just dragged and dropped this onto the line Y axis. And then by by default, it does a sum on sales amount. Uh, but you, you know you can do any of these other aggregations. You could do average, minimum, maximum. So um, it's this can lead to some ambiguity though, because as you can see, this one field can be used in different ways on different on different visualizations. So uh, it can it can just lead to a little bit of confusion as to how that field is being used. So if we're de designing a data set with self-service in mind, uh, we want our measures to be clear and easy to identify as possible. So we'll want to create explicit measures such as, let's look at um, here, expand this to here. This is a total sales amount field. And here it's straightforward, just sum on sales, sales amount. Right, but it's very clear as to what this measure does. Whenever this measure is used, it will be doing a total on sales amount. And then we can create a max on sales amount if you wanted that or min. You know, you want to create measures that explicitly do a particular action on a field and use that. That way, when your users see it used on a report, they know exactly what it's doing. Ugh, boring. Okay. Yeah, and then uh, you want to make sure you want to have uh, you want to hide it. You want to do hiding of support fields. So one of the things here when we go to the model view, uh, I have these support tables here where we could do sorting, um, categorization. We have, have various reporting groups done here. Um, I hid these uh, from the user. Uh, well, from the reporting view, that way uh, it, users are, are not using that uh, when they're, say, doing their ad hoc analysis or they're doing their own variations of the report, really. Um, so if they want to be able to, to use those for any reason, uh, they can go into the other views and turn those on. Uh, but by default, I just keep those hidden. I also hide um, the different keys so um, the way I design my my data sets are in a Kimball star schema model. So I have everything Music set up with my ears. We love yeah. to hear that. Yeah. So yep, I always set up keys on everything. And the thing is, your users are not using keys in their reporting, right? You know, you, you use you know you, maybe when you're setting up relationships and things like that, right? But you're not using that in your reporting. So I always hide those and. Um, just to, to keep that uh, away from like the main uh, view of the data. Uh, and again, you know, if people are savvy, they can go into the other views and they can they can look at them, they can unhide them. It, it, it could be good for doing uh, data analysis. You know, if you're if you're investigating any kind of gaps in your data, any data issues, maybe you want to bring in the key and you want to see, you know, what kind of keys are being used um on an, on a table so that you can you know trace that back to source data and such but uh generally you're not doing any kind of reporting or dashboarding on key data right so one of the things that uh i also like to do is to separate the report PBIX from the master data PBIX, um, well, from the data itself, right? So one of the things that you can do to to do that is, so say I created this data set, I created this report, and I want to share this data set across my department or across my organization. Well, a very simple way of doing that is just by deleting your visualizations. So what you could do is create a new page and then delete, say, the page with your visualizations. Now you have an empty report. And then you can just save your PBIX file. 
And I like to call it just uh, something that looks like uh, master, master data. Now this master data file is a very thin file. All it has is your data, there's no visualizations on it. And then you can publish that master data PBIX file off to the service. So you now what you can go to, say in my AdventureWorks demo area. Um, and so once that's published out, once that master data PBIX file is published out to the service, you can, uh, if it's set up correctly within your tenant settings and within your organization, you could create another Power BI report and just pull down that data set separately. So here's um, the, that master data sets, uh, data set on the Power BI service, and then I can create a new Power BI session and just pull that down on getting in the get data dialog. Just give this a minute there. It just pulled up on my other screen here, so let me just pull this over here. Let's get data and get Power BI. So, um, very straightforward stuff, especially if you've done Power BI before. But you know, this is the kind of thing where uh, you you want to set the, these things up explicitly for users who are not who may not be Power BI experts, right? This this kind of simple stuff, this very basic stuff, is 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 is, is, is comes might come as common sense for an experienced Power BI user. But if you're if you're trying to set up self service, you're you're trying to reach out to users who are who may not be Power BI experts, and you want things set up as as straightforward and clean as possible. Um, and that way it, it encourages them to, to learn more about Power BI, to use Power BI more, to, to be champions of Power BI within the organization. Um, because you know, there's, so, there's so many other tools out there that are competing for, for, for use within the organization for data consumption and data analysis. Uh, and you wanna set up a, the environment that's friendly uh, to all kinds of, use, to all users of all levels. And so one of the things here is, um, so I have that master data set that I set up there, right? But what you actually really want to do is you want to set up endorsed data. So say my data set that I set up, uh, let's say I actually want to give it an endorsement. So I'll go back here, go back to my workspace. And because you know you have users who are going to be uploading their own data sets, um, and over time you you'll want, like I said, some policy. You don't want just a completely business-led self-service. You want that managed self-service environment. So you'll want some kind of policy in place in order to identify re uh, reliable data sets. So you can use the promoted endorsement. So uh, here's that master data set here that I uploaded. You can go into settings. And then you could go down to endorsements and discovery. And you could set this to promoted. And then you can make it discoverable. So meaning that uh, users without access to the data set can still search for it and find it and just request permission to access that data set. So that's the um, the first level of um, endorsement. The next level of endorsement would be uh, to make it certified. Now, certified is a more involved endorsement, and it gives you the option to allow for documentation for your organization's certifi certification criteria. Uh, this will be enabled within your Power BI tenant settings. So let's go in here. Um, and let's go to the admin portal. Let's give us a minute here. Oh. So what you'll want to do, oh, this is actually just doing capacity settings. So settings.
So what you'll want to actually do is uh, set up the actually I have a screenshot of it here actually because I actually have in one of my clients I have that set up for certification and what I did was I actually took a screenshot of it and um, I blacked out some of the details because that is specific to their installation. So here's the in their admin portal uh, under tenant settings. You have the certification. We enabled that and we you can specify a URL for the documentation page. And then um, we have a SharePoint PDF file that tells you uh, what UAT steps were taken and who signed off on the uh, UAT and and what teams and what uh, key contacts signed off and on what days. And then we uh, we give a specific security group access to that certification um, ability. So that's a it's a more involved um, endorsement process. So and you so you you want a combination of those two things if you have the um, the policies in place to do that. What's great about that too is when you are pulling data into a Power BI report, let's get data from the Power BI data sets. When you click on this filter here, endorsed by your org, all your endorsed data sets will quickly come up over here, you know, which is much better than having a ton of data sets here that can be used by, that can be created by yourself or by other people in your organization. So when you have an endorsed tag there, it quickly filters that to the data sets that you want to use um, for your self-service. And you'll see either promoted or certified. And if it's certified, it'll tell you who it's certified by. So if you have any questions on the data, you know who to contact. Any questions on anything that I've done so far here? All right. So one of the things that we'll do now is go back to the report that I created and we'll show off some of these Power BI features. So here's a variation of the report that we just looked at. And let's see some of the additions we had here. So there's a slice by slicer here, and you can see you can run this on channel or category or color. And you can see it drives just this visualization down here. There are many ways to do that, but what this is using is the field parameter. So that is a, a new uh, preview feature in Power BI. And this, uh, let's take a look at how we can enable that preview feature. Go here, File, Options. And if we go down to Preview Features, so we'll need a couple things here. We'll need to enable the field parameters, and then we'll need to enable direct query for PBI data sets and analysis services. Okay, so we'll need to enable uh, those two pieces. The reason why we want that second option selected is because when we're creating a field parameter, it creates a local mixed model if you have a live connection to a data set. Because you know we were talking about uploading a master data set to the service and using that um, via Power BI to, to pull down uh, as a live connection. But then enabling this allows the creation of composite models, right? And uh, field parameters requires that. All right, so then now let's take a look at one of the field parameter. Um, let's take a look at here. We'll open up a new session to see how we can actually create one of those field parameters. So what we'll do is, uh, so there's a couple ways of well, actually, let's take a look at the code. That's actually going to be a better way, I think. So one of the things that we'll want to do is go to modeling, and you'll see that you have this 
new parameter feature here. So you could do fields. And there you can create a new field parameter. So let's call this. Um, say sales fields or let's call it a slice by demo. We could select customer, city, let's do categories and create. So there it creates a slight and there's here's our field parameter that we created. So that's how you would create one from from scratch. And let's say you want to edit an existing field parameter, right? So the GUI doesn't give you, um, well, there isn't a GUI uh, way of, of editing an existing field parameter uh, table. So I actually have an existing uh, slice by uh, field parameter here. What we can do is create a new parameter there. I'm going to copy and paste there. I'm going to change this sorting value. And let's uh, run this on, let's say, state providence. Let's call this state. Let's get rid of that one. You can see this here. Now we've got state. Okay, you could change the channel to internet. And there we are. So you're able to change the field parameters available to us there, right? So we can create a new field term, uh, parameter table, or uh, we can edit an existing field parameter. Any questions on that right now? Okay. So, uh, questions. Sorry, oh. I just, uh, oh, I mean, from where you created the parameters, sorry, I missed it actually. So the first one that you created, right? Can you just point me once how to create the parameter? Oh, yes. So uh, let's take a look. So one thing you want to make sure again is in the, this is easy to miss, you want to make sure you have enabled the field parameters, right? So under the preview features, you want to make sure that they're, um, that field parameters are available. And uh, if you're doing a live connection, uh, you want to make sure that this is that direct query is enabled. Uh, but then you'll go to modeling, and over here where it says new field, uh, new parameter, click there and click down to fields. And then oh, in good, here, good. you can do you create your slice by or whichever, however you want to call it. Okay. So uh, let's look at this this other slicer here, um, report measures. So this allows you to select either units or sales. So you can see that this now our, our measures can dynamically refresh between them. So yeah, it allows you to your, your visuals to dynamically select a measure to display. Uh, this requires looking at the DAX that we use in our data set. So um, you remember, like we split our data set. So uh, if I actually try to look at our DAX here, um, yeah, let's select this visual here. We can see the field that we use is called total selected. And if I go here, you know, I can't see the DAX there, right? So um, because we're doing that via a direct query. So 
Um, there's a couple ways of you can you can do this. Uh, this is kind of an aside, but one way I I like to do this is by having my master data set kind of loaded on the side, and um, and within this Power BI session, I can now look at the say total sales or total sales selected measure here, and I can see the uh, the DAX used for that measure. Or if you have um, tabular editor installed and you have that hooked up to your uh, to your master data set, you can use it. Uh, you can actually see the DAX within tabular editor. I like to use uh, tabular editor. Um, it's to me, it's, it's makes it, it makes editing or managing your DAX or especially if you're creating reports from scratch or uh, you're doing a lot of uh, DAX measure creation. Um, it makes it really quick to to use. Um, well, it makes it really quick to make changes or create new measures um, in Tabular Editor 2. Uh, I know in Tabular Editor 3, you can connect to a data set that's on the service. So have like a live connection to the data set. But you know, I've just used uh, Tabular Editor 2, which is uh, the free version. Um, and then of course, if you're making changes to your um, PBIX file, you'll need to then re-upload that PBIX file to the service to make sure um, your, any of your changes uh, get applied to all the reports that are connected to that data set, right, over the service. So, um, but looking at this total selected field, you see that what we're doing is we're running a selected value on this table report groups using the selected measure field. So that's say, let's take a look at that here. Port groups. Oh yeah, wrong. Because uh, again, this is over the service here. So we want to go here report groups and you can see it's a table I just created that has two values sales or units. And then uh, we just use a simple switch to determine if we're looking at sales we do we pull in this measure total sales amount if we're, if we're looking at units we'll pull in total order quantity. Now I know there are many different ways of doing this um, and I know like there are DAX experts that can do this as a one liner uh, make it really uh, really slick. But the point is, you know, we're developing uh, not necessarily for Power BI and DAX experts. We're develop, we're we're creating these these measures and this data set to be used by you know uh, analysts, by business users. So we want to make your DAX as, as simple, clean, and as easy to read as possible. That way, you know, it, if people are looking at your code or reusing it, um, they know exactly what it's doing. You know, you're, you're, you're not trying to do it in, in the fewest lines or as few, fewest words as possible. You, you want to try to make sure that it's it's clean and, and easy to understand. So there are a couple other visualizations that allow for customization. There is the decomposition tree. So uh, this is um, a popular report for first to give to someone who wants to use uh, wants some level of customization, right? You can select the different values under the fields in your tree, or you can change the the explain by value pretty easily, right? So that's pretty useful to use. Uh, here's another use of a field parameter is creating uh, using multiple selections. You can see here we've got, uh, let's say clothing broken out by those different fields and you can customize that just by uh, selecting or unselecting different values in your data parameter slicer here. And this was created just using another um, field parameter. And then, of course, using bookmarks, you can switch between, say, a matrix and a table. I won't go into just all the uh, steps needed for, for doing bookmarks, because um, a lot of the stuff 
they can be sessions in and of themselves, but these are just trying to generate ideas, give you ideas on, on what kind of visuals you can create, what kind of techniques you can use to encourage um, report reuse. Um, one of the most common questions I get uh, when I'm creating a report is, is saying, I just want to see the data. And oftentimes just creating a, a bookmark that has just a table view uh, that that gets some um, close enough to to that kind of view of the data that they uh, they're usually asking for. You know, with these with these features, we go from a single use report to uh, a multi use report, which allows users to slice and dice reports themselves rather than requesting uh, the same report over and over. Right? I've, I've seen that in different organizations, right? The same dashboard, but this one's by units and this one's by dollars or this one shows by model where this one is the same thing, but shows it by um, by SKU or something like that, right? So you want to create the ability for users to to make those customizations on on their own, kind of be uh, preemptive, right? And those kinds of requests, and that way users can create their own uh, analysis, to do their own ad hoc report creation without having to say open a ticket with the service desk or uh, waiting for a, a BI developer to come back, you know, a week later when they're when their plates uh, cleaned up and you know to, to get back to uh, your analysis. So just you want to set things up so that they can uh, do a lot of that stuff themselves. All right, so let's look at a different scenario. Let's say I'm a BI analyst uh, working within a department. Um, let's say we have some kind of internal goals that we want to compare against our data. Uh, maybe it's not ready for full deployment across the organization, so I don't need it to go to an engineer to build directly into the model yet. So let's say I want to sideload some goals data. So how can we do that? So again, we've got our trusted data connected over the service using direct query, and then we can sideload, clicking on the Excel workbook, Say we have a, an Excel sheet with some simple goals in place. So we can just select that in and create that kind of composite modeling. And we can just load that in. So we got it's pretty straightforward. It's just got categories, sales goals, and unit goals. All right, so I've done that already. I've got the goals table right here. And you know, we can just manage our relationship. And we can set up relationship between category and goal, a product category and goal category. Hey, you know, there are probably better ways of doing this, you know, doing it by key. I know we just talked about doing keys earlier, probably the better way of doing it. But in this case, I just wanted to throw up something really quick there. And then uh, we've got a goal chart here. So we're, we've got the total selected with the goal selected. Now, this is a composite modeling scenario here so I actually create a local measure that uh, does the same kind of selected value work uh, to determine whether we're looking at sales goals or units goals I didn't have to go to tabular editor or to the master data set to to look at this since this is kind of a a fork off of a a certified report this is our own goal report that we've created um, I can do that just creating a in the, my composite model here and you can tell we're in composite mode um, down here where it says storage mode mixed. So we've got a mixed situation here. All right, so let's say uh, I actually want to put my goals out there to the organization and I want to give one set uh, rule. I had a good question come through and I, I do want you to highlight this. Which yes. visual are you using for the bike units by color graph? I know what the answer is. Um, oh yeah, <laughs> so this is, is this here the waterfall chart. I think the waterfall chart is great for like project management, like finance needs. Um, mm -hmm. We use it for one of our like our sales CRM reports. Um, but yeah, Brian, that it's a, a great one, and again, another standard visual, just like um, sorry, the decomposition tree. These are all standard visuals we're looking at here. 
Yep. Yeah, these are these are not custom visuals. These are all standard visuals, but they just look a little different. They feel a little different just because we've you know done the 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 work with the field parameters or with the uh, dynamic uh, uh, fields here. So it's just it's it just adds spice to that. Um, I I really like just stick sticking with the with the standard visuals there. Uh, I actually love the waterfall. I wish I see it more often. Uh, yeah, you're right. We do often see this in, in project management. Um, uh, dashboards. Uh, I lo would love to see this more often. Yeah. So, um, so this kind of this scenario with the goals, we've created uh, a composite model off of a local um, spreadsheet that we've created. You know, say this is for my department. I, I wanted to kind of create a um, proof of concept, right? I just want to test it out. I want to share it with, with just my team. But now I want to deploy this out and I actually want um, other users and other departments to use my goal data or maybe add to it themselves. Well, one way you can do that is by creating a data flow. So let's see here. We've got actually have a data flow in here. Goals. So what you can do is just customize this here. So I've actually set this up uh, with a with a goal spreadsheet on SharePoint. So as you can see my source here. It's an Excel workbook. Um, I gave it a path to a OneDrive directory, uh, which you know, goes through the SharePoint authorization uh, connection process. So it's shared. Other people can add additional goals data, make adjustments to it. You know, if you have your permission set up appropriately, you know, talked about an introduction on SharePoint administration. That's a role in and of itself, and that's uh, that's very important. So you know, with that in place, you, know, you can you can set up these kind of shared documents and shared data sets, hook them up to a a data flow, right? And then now you've got your data flow here and you can actually just call that up in Power BI as its own separate table. So let me uh, show you how to do that. So what that allows us to do is, in this example, in this in this goal example, it's, it's a small table, it's not a lot of data, but I've seen users use this for other, like say fact tables that have a lot of data and you want to set up separate incremental refreshes on its own schedule. You can do that with power um, with data flows. Let's uh, let's pull that in uh, to get data. And I'm signed into the service. I want power platform. And Greg, this is what I was talking about. See power BI data flows. It's set up as legacy now or actually uh, yes. so you got regular data flows there, but now then you have power flows. BI data flows. Yeah. Yep. What I was saying in chat was it seems like data flows is becoming more of a cross product product thing in Power Platform. And so mm -hmm. I think they're trying to make more of that standard name because it's not just Power BI, right? Yes. So you're this, right. It's the Power Query is getting implemented into everything and everything. Um, mm -hmm. You know, we're also we're also seeing Power Query in Azure Data Factory. Um, and so of course our Microsoft marketing friends uh, are hard at work making it more complicated than it needs to be, but uh, makes <laughs> this one makes sense to me. Yeah, yeah, you're right. Yeah, so I just signed in through the service and I've got my AdventureWorks demo, my goals, and my goals. And I can just load that in as its own separate table. Um, and then I can uh, either attach my own data set to it or another endorsed uh, data set along with it. By the way, quick question. I, I, it's only because my naivete with data flows because I haven't built it myself, but can you have multiple sources in a data flow? Because the way I think of a data flow is it's just packaged power query that you can bring mm -hmm. in compartmentalized. There's no different limitation aside from the data you can actually you know, scram through it. Is that true? Yeah, I believe so. And I think that's the point of actually, can you maybe I actually wonder if you can add another because this is one query. 
honestly, I haven't played too much with data flows. Uh, I wonder if you can enter additional data and create another table within the data flow and have your data flow actually bring in multiple tables, and then you can select which table you want to bring in on that flow. You know what I mean? Yeah. yeah. I haven't I haven't tried that, but um, would be interesting to to dig into that a little more. Raymond does confirm yes, you can, and yep, Christine does too. You can absolutely have multiple. Yeah. Again, it's think of a data flow like a Power Query container, and you can bring that container, you know, to build a data set. And so, you know, typically I've seen data flows like time intelligence, right? Like, hey, let's mm -hmm. all use the same calendar table as a data mm -hmm. flow. Let me pull that calendar table in. One person's maintaining to make sure the whole organization's time intelligence, our finance calendar, all that <laughs> stuff, Gregorian chant or Gregorian calendar, <laughs> whatever you want to use. It's like one data flow that uh, all the different Power BI developers can leverage. Yep, absolutely. Yeah, it's actually one of the projects that uh, I, was, I was just finishing up right now is switching to retail 445 calendar, I believe it is. Mm. Yeah, yeah. Love so, those. Yeah, yeah. And <laughs> that, that required a big rework. Just more fields and more data uh, to the date table. Yeah, that, that was interesting. But uh, yeah, definitely uh, want to do that with this, with data flows. But then we can also talk about the latest addition to Power BI, which is the Data Mart. Mm -hmm. So, the Data Mart is a is a fully functional uh, SQL relational database. So let me actually pull up have the Data Mart set up right here. All right, let's go into Data Mart. So, um. And it's actually often uh, compared to data flows because um, it does give you, it, it combines Power Query, but also allows you to, to create measures. So you have DAX functionality. Uh, so in here, you can see this is a, a data mart. Uh, I can create a new measure. Let's say this is sales here. And I can create, well, let's look at, have total sales amount in here. And, and this is within the service, right? This is not desktop. This is within the service. I can create a new measure. And I can call this, uh, say, total quantity, right? It's simple. Right, but we've created a measure within our data mart within uh, the Power BI service. Right, and then you can run queries against that, this data mart here. So uh, this is actually a SQL relational database, actually. So you can see here I've got a, a SQL query running category, fiscal year, sum over sales amount as sales amount, right, from sales, which is, you know, the sales table joining on product key against the product table, right? And joining on the date calendar and the date table, grouping by category. Pretty straightforward uh, SQL. So you can actually run SQL within the Power BI service against your data. You can build a, a visual query. So this is a merge. So I'm merging between sales and customer and creating a merged table there. And then I can I can view the SQL. You know, it didn't do anything too complicated here. Uh, actually, let me show you. Let's see. Again, power uh, data marts is a little tricky. So sometimes uh, I, I run into some errors here and there. So I kind of cross my fingers whenever I. I work on this. Let's do a demo Mart 2. Let's create this. And I'm going to create this off of a Excel worksheet. Um, like I was mentioning earlier uh, on the call, the the data marts is a, one of the, the the newest features, and it's definitely and it's something that you need to enable within um, Power BI Premium or Premium Pure User uh, because it, it actually spins up 
an Azure uh, SQL database with that's associated with your premium account. So you don't actually need to create an Azure resource uh, for SQL Server or Azure SQL or anything like that. It's all it's all done automatically in the background, uh, tied to your uh, premium um, your premium account. Now, I don't know how the um, the, the cost of this will change in the future because this is, like I said, still in preview, still actively being developed, uh, there's being roadmapped. Uh, at some point, I, I don't know if it'll change. Um, it will continue just to be a add on to an existing Power Premium, um, uh, sorry, Power BI Premium feature. Uh, it would be interesting to see how they they implement this. Um, but what we can do is let's actually this is going to take some time here because sometimes it this takes oh I think it just came back all right here we are so now I can bring it into Excel let me upload a file okay and so I'm, this is just an AdventureWorks um, Excel work uh, workbook it's got various uh, sheets on here with various tables data tables. So I'm gonna, it's just uploading that now, setting up my credentials. And then I'll select uh, what data I actually want to bring in. All right, here we are. Oh, let's bring in the customer, the date, the product, and the sales. It's pretty straightforward. And then it's going to go through the data and, and determine the the columns. You know, of course, you can. Uh, you probably want to spend some time and go through this and make sure that we got what we want as we want it. Let's just save that. So it's going to build the power querying. It's going to set up an ETL process, create the relationships, and you kind of try to pick up any standard relationships. And it's going to start loading the data in. So. We've got um, our dimension tables came in pretty quick. OK, our fact, our sales fact table came in pretty quick, wrapping things up. OK, so now that we're here, what we can do is. We can say manage roles. Actually, let me work with my existing because um, I actually. Set this up. It's kind of like a uh, home shopping network when you've got your pre-baked chicken. So I'm going to just show that here. Gotta love that pre-baked chicken. Mm, <laughs> making me hungry. <laughs> yeah, it's getting to dinner time, right? So. Let's <laughs> oh, the settings there. Data Mart. OK, so. Um, Good question I have. Uh, yeah, have go you for ever it. used chat GPT? to create dummy data for Power BI, or are you still using AdventureWorks? Still using AdventureWorks, but that's a great, I, you know, I've I've been looking at ChatGPT. I was actually playing around with that a, a few months ago, um, mm -hmm. just to create, get, get ideas for content creation. Um, but that's a really good idea. I haven't, I haven't tried that. Um, I'll, I'll definitely, have you, have you, have you done that? Uh, I, I was literally just talking to my team about doing it for this. We finally have a use case to like dummy up data. I think I was uh -huh. funny enough. I was even talking to Raymond about that too for like training data sets that are like very business specific. Um, but got to get in. Raymond, have you tried it yet? <laughs> not, not yet. No, I, I just got through building out a data set for this kind of stuff. But I cool. was with, but yeah. Cool. Uh, that's really cool. interesting cool. though. We got to do it. I know we've all got like a million other things on our plates, but we'll get there. <laughs> yeah, definitely a project to, to check out. I'm really excited by chat GPT, by the way. It's just it's especially with being it's being more incorporated into the Microsoft environment, uh, you know, with Office first. But, you know, who knows how it goes into everything else that Microsoft is developing. Yeah. Yeah, so from within here, like if we click on the model tab there we can see we've got our relationships so i set up you know i've got this kimball star schema up here um you can set up your relationships 
me just zoom in a little bit. You can see this is normally what you would do in Power BI Desktop, but you could do it in the service, right? So I have my sales order line key, one to many onto sales order. My customer key there set up. See customer key to customer key from customer to sales. And then uh, I've got my roles. So I've created a, a role here on sales territory. Uh, I set it to country equals United States. Okay, and then I assigned a user uh, to this United States role. I assigned Amy here, who, who's at, who will only have access to the United States. So all within the Power BI service, you've got pretty much your ETL stack, right? You've got role management, um, you've got model design, uh, data import, uh, you can do data transformations, and then of course you can do the reporting. You can create a new report right off of that data mart. There. So what does this all have to do with self-service? The idea is that you know, Microsoft is investing highly into empowering users to, to be fully involved in the whole stack, uh, is to, to stand up their own SQL server, uh, to, to, to implement their own uh, permissions management uh, and create reporting off of that. So they're, they're trying to do more to empower users in creating their own uh, reporting and managing them that managing that themselves and rather than going having to go through IT or through the data science engineering team. Now that sounds kind of scary and, and I actually don't think that that should be it should be total anarchy in that sense. I, I do think there is a need for having some centralization. I do think this is great for say doing proof of concept work, um, doing things that are departmental based. Um, but if you want to have organizational wide power bi i do think you still want to have those policies that infrastructure in place with managed and endorsed data sets and data architecture um, but setting up your data and your reporting tools that encourages users to play around with it encourages users to uh, create the, their own variations of reporting and share those around because overall that just promotes use of power bi and just makes users more confident and comfortable with the environment so with that, that uh, that wraps up everything. Uh, again, I just want to make sure that people understand data marts are great. Uh, the, I'm actually really excited by it. I wouldn't go live on production with this yet. Uh, there's, you know, luckily I didn't have many issues in today's demo, but I have run into situations where connection breaks and things like that. It's still actively developed. I highly encourage users if you're interested in data marts to. Uh, check out the Power BI Data Mart documentation on the Microsoft blog. Lots of great information here. There's great things you can do. You can even grab your SQL uh, connection string and run queries right from Management Studio against it, uh, against your Data Mart data. That's really neat. Um, you've got, yeah, yeah, so this is the, the January uh, feature summary that's got some, some updates and I recommend signing up the Power BI newsletter to, to keep up to date with the latest Power BI developments. For sure. And I see uh, Jason has his hand up. Jason, do you have a question or comment? I do have a question. Uh, Raul, thank you so much. This is awesome content. I am actually have been working on uh, creating a master data set that mm -hmm. report builders. I got a group of like 15 report builders out there that use my master data set to build off of. Love to hear um, it. One thing that I've run into is uh, a report builder might want to sideload some Excel data in mm -hmm. to append to what's on the master data set. And that works as you just demonstrated, but when that report builder person publishes that report and tries to distribute it to users, they run into permission issues where build permission is required mm -hmm. on the master data set. Are you familiar with this issue? Yes, I am. Yeah, yeah. And you need like have a, a gateway set up or something to to have them access the data set. I, yeah, yeah. That's why when when I would do a composite model based off a local uh, 
Excel report. Um, yeah, that, that would only be used. I think that's for that user only. I, I would set that up. Um, if I would then move, if, if, if you want to deploy it across the organization for other people to use, either set that up via SharePoint and, or do it as a data, uh, data flow. I think that could resolve your build issue. Um, okay. Have I, you? It's ahead. it's a known issue, and I'm putting the link to the the bug in the chat. Oh, okay. And if everyone on this call could <laughs> vote up this idea, because I've been waiting almost a year for this to get fixed, where you don't need build permission just to view a report off of a composite data set. All right. Yeah. Voting. I will vote voting in. right now. Yeah, let's let's sign in here. Yeah. You get 40 yeah. votes today. Awesome. Let's do it. Yeah, I see what you mean. Not just not just to refresh it, but to actually just even view it, you need the the build permission. I see. Yeah, let's let's uh let's vote that up. Okay. Great. Thank you for thank you for that. Awesome. Thank you, Mr. Jason. Good to see Thank you. Thank uh, you. Brian also has his hand up. Brian, do you have a question or comment? I and do. you can only ask the question if you voted. <laughs> <laughs> I'm kidding. Uh, my, my question is, is simple, I hope. Uh, is it possible to show confidence interval lines on a graph? Oh, boy. Uh, I, let me see. I haven't thought of that. Uh, let me see. Does anyone else here on the on the call have any idea on that? Because I haven't thought of doing you, that. You, you can definitely do like trend lines, um, and you can uh, you can configure the line based on your y axis. You know, if if it's a confidence level, though, like explain more on the confidence piece. Okay. Well, for example, uh, right now I have right, a. Static. Um, uh, a linear regression graph. So I have a single line. Okay. So you can visualize that. But what I'd like to do is add a conf two confidence interval lines. And, gotcha. I, and, and just in using the GUI, I, I don't see how to do that. It, it gives me the option of adding a, a trend line. Uh, but the other options there don't appear to be related to a confidence interval. So I was wondering, I, I'm assuming that this, since this is something I would assume many people would do, I, I'm hoping that it can be done simply in the GUI and I'm just simply not recognizing what the options are allowing me to do. You you can do a static line. And so it sounds like you want to create like static lines for those confidence intervals, you know, on, as a Y value. Yeah, right. It wouldn't be a trend line, but you can do a static line based on, you know, your Y values. Um, so, so can you, if you choose the option of doing a static line, can you also then uh, show the trend line itself? So in other words, you have three lines on the graph. I believe so. You can stack them. Can you? I don't know. If, I don't think there is a, a max. I don't know if it's an either or. Has anybody um, done both? Because I feel like the trend line is different than the static line because it's more it's more of a cosmetic thing versus you know like an actual like trend regression. Yeah, we've 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 done that where we've got a static line. Maybe you want to show like a target, and then show what the trend is against it. So we we I've done both. So use the static line option to show your confidence intervals and then stack it mm -hmm. to, to add the regression line itself. Yes. OK, all right. I'll make note of that and, and give it a try. Thank you very much. Great. Yeah, got me. It's got me thinking about that, too. Very good. Thank you. Thinking on your toes ain't easy. Sometimes like when people <laughs> ask me questions and it's like something I know I know, but like I just like freeze up. I'm like, ah. Yeah, <laughs> yeah especially I've just been in the in the service this whole time. So it's been that's been my mindset lately. Yeah. That's all good. 
do we have any other questions or comments? Oh, I see there is a comment here about uh, implementing naming conventions for data sets or data flows in end of your environments. We require standalone data sets, start with DS and DF makes. Yeah, that that's a great suggestion. That's a great idea. Standardizing your data set, standardizing your data flows. I try to do that with my measures too. I try to make my measures uh, kind of fo follow a consistent kind of uh, naming convention. Um, that way you know when there's a total or when it's a max or a min. Uh, but yeah, taking that same idea to data flows, uh, data sets is great. It's a good call, Raymond. Yeah, it's all about, you know, you know, this, this stuff is not, it's not the most complicated uh, stuff in the world. It's pretty straightforward stuff, but you know, all these little pieces, just taking the time to set that all up. And uh, it just, it just invites users to, to, to play around with your data and, and lowers that kind of barrier to entry uh, for um, Power BI adoption in your organization. I would like for us to come off mute and turn on your cameras to give you a round of applause, Raul. You took a wide spin swing at so many great <laughs> points and concepts, you know, kind of condensed in what you did that in like an hour. Amazing. So <laughs> thank you so much. Thank you for being with us. Uh, keeping it weird in Portland, all the way from San Diego. <laughs> thank you. Appreciate you. Yes. Thanks, everyone. Thank you very much. <laughs>